thank you everybody for coming today virtually. I hope you all uh, received an email from me recently where I outlined some of the things that you can take advantage of as you're making your decision about graduate school <clears throat> in terms of maybe sitting in on classes and um, making appointments with professors. I'm going to try to quickly go through um, my presentation because I'm sure there's plenty of questions that people will have and I want to provide plenty of time for that. But if we don't get to your questions, I also encourage you to reach out to uh, establish a meeting with myself or one of the other professors I uh, uh, outlined in that in that email. So first of all, <clears throat> I want to congratulate all of you on uh, being admitted to our, our IDS program, which I, I believe, uh, although I am biased, is the best international development program you can uh, you can choose from. Uh, we have a particular kind of um, approach to the study of international development. Our mission statement is that our goal is for you to be able to operate at the forefront of the development field, capable of addressing global development challenges ethically in the most disadvantaged regions and among the most marginalized populations. So we have a, a multidisciplinary program <clears throat> with a focus on critical analysis and ethic, ethical practice. Um, our, our classes are all in the evening, which allows for internships or work. Uh, classes are taught by both academics and development practitioners. Um, and our capstone projects are, I think, quite unique. Uh, you essentially work as pro bono consultants uh, with international development organizations, and, and you are responsible for seeking out uh, those consultancies. Uh, we, we guide you to that, but um, it's essentially uh, just the same as if you were doing a consultancy, although you're not getting paid. Um, <clears throat> there's also opportunities for summer internships abroad. Uh, there's uh, increasingly we have short field-based courses um, and we have some study abroad programs, but most of our students tend to uh, uh, do internships in the summer and tend to stay in D.C. during the school year, uh, in part because of the way our program is structured. Um, <clears throat> the capstone is an invaluable practical experience. Um, you form groups and uh, on that basis, you you seek out a client for, for whom you will uh, carry out a project. Um, it's usually field-based applied research, and it's mentored by IDS faculty, and we found that it really sets you apart in your job search after graduation. Uh, our program, in terms of your thematic focus, is extremely flexible. We want you to pursue your passion. So we have a series of core, core courses which you would take with your entering class um, uh, that ensure that you have kind of the core competencies that are required of all development practitioners. And those include um, theory, policy, and practice, uh, economic development, research methods, and development management. And for some of those, for the cornerstone, the international development policy and practice, and capstone, those you only take with other IDS students. The other classes uh, have some more flexibility, but we have a list of classes that fulfill those requirements. And then your area of specialization is negotiated with your advisor. And it's open to any field or any combination of topics. A lot of people will will come to our program thinking that the illustrative field of specializations that you see on the website are your only choices. That's not the case. You can uh, develop a, a field of specialization that's cross-cutting. It can be very specific. It can be broader. 
um, but it's really of your own design. <clears throat> we also have a range of one credit professional skills courses, uh, some, some of which, you know, deal just with uh, uh, more generic professional skills like, like public speaking and writing, but others uh, focus particularly on skills related to development. <clears throat> and finally, you have access to courses throughout the university. Um, not just at the Elliott School. And even uh, from, you can take up to two courses at one of the other consortium universities in the DC area, which includes essentially all of the DC schools um, with graduate programs uh, with the exception of Johns Hopkins SICE. <clears throat> I wanted, you know, I think given the current circumstances, it makes sense to talk a little bit about uh, the kind of accommodations we're taking for uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we're trying to keep continuity in our training of development pr practitioners during this time. Um, we've brought all classes online. We've established some extracurricular um, things, including a contest for designing projects that address various development challenges in the context of the crisis. Uh, we're going to bring our capstone presentations online, uh, and those will be on May 1st, and we'll be inviting all the IDS admitted, admitted students to that. Um, <clears throat> also, the capstone, uh, the capstone projects of our graduating class have, have all changed quite a bit. They were all preparing to travel right prior to this crisis. And they weren't able to travel, but they've um, all adapted their projects, I think, quite, quite well to the situation, having done already a lot of desk research and administering a lot of their field work through uh, Skype interviews, through uh, internet surveys, and so on. And <clears throat> we're trying to make con contingency plans for students who may have difficulties committing uh, to being in Washington, D.C. in the fall semester. So we're exploring plans to offer a flex option for the fall, which I think you're going to hear more about very soon. And that would allow those students who are unable to move to Washington uh, during the fall, whether it's due to financial uncertainty, visas, health concerns, et cetera, uh, to take their first semester online. So that would include we're going to work on an online version of our cornerstone class, which would be something that everybody would be taking uh, in addition to several other uh, classes. <clears throat> and you'll get more details on this um, in the near future. And also, as I outlined in my email, there's <clears throat> several things you can do to learn more about our program virtually. We usually like this time of year when admitted students come to campus. Um, we get to meet them, uh, answer all their questions in person. Unfortunately, this year that's impossible. Um, but as I mentioned in my email, um, you can sit in, in on an online class. Uh, and I encourage you to contact Melissa, our program assistant at IDS at gwu.edu uh, to arrange that. Uh, we, make, we encourage you to make appointments with our faculty members to hear more about IDS, their work, or anything else in which you're interested. Uh, and I gave a list of faculty um, in my email, and I think uh, if you contact Melissa, she can also arrange uh, for you to meet with other faculty members. And, and we very much encourage you to join on May 1st for our capstone presentations, um, because I think that'll give you a really good idea of um, what you come out the other side of the program with. Um, our core faculty uh, include myself, uh, Professor Christina Fink, uh, Dr. Samuel Letterman, um, and we have a new faculty member coming on this coming semester, Miriam DeLoffrey, who will be focusing particularly on humanitarian assistance. Um, 
And you can explore, you know, our biographies, our research interests, the classes that we teach. Um, and you can also reach out to us, uh, any of us, if you would like to talk about um, what to expect in the IDS program and from classes at the Elliott School. Uh, I think that one of our real strengths is that we have a very strong community. Uh, it's a cohort-based program. So you come in with uh, the entering class and you, you essentially develop really strong bonds with uh, your colleagues during that time. You take core classes all together. You end up um, creating groups for your capstone together. Um, there's also an organization for international development, which is a IDS student-led organization that you can kind of give character to your class. You can organize social events and academic events and professional events um, through that organization. Uh, and I think that really this aspect of the program is particularly important uh, for the field of international development because you need to kind of establish that network of uh, colleagues that um, you can draw from and learn from. And throughout your program, you will certainly learn a lot from other students. We have a very diverse uh, student body that's a vibrant mix of U.S. and international students as well as a mix of people with quite a bit of experience in international development and those who are just at the beginning of their career. Um, in terms of after graduation, this is just an illustrative list. Really, most of our students, um, you know, the almost 90%, 95%, I would say, end up working specifically in the international development field. Um, in a broad array of organizations, in government, international organizations, NGOs, corporations, consulting firms, uh, et cetera. And this is just kind of an illustrative list. It changes every year, but we certainly have alumni working at USAID, uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation, UNDP, World Bank, uh, the uh, <clears throat> State Department, the various uh, Consulting firms like Commonix, Bechtel, uh, NGOs like PACT, FHI 360, the Urban Institute, Mercy Corps, uh, et cetera. Um, resources, I encourage you to explore some of our social media. Um, the Facebook page is particularly useful because you get interaction between alumni and students, um, and you could certainly contact uh, Melissa if you were interested in um, uh, joining the Facebook page. Um, you can also contact me if you have any questions and Melissa. Melissa, in addition to being the program assistant, is also a first-year student, so she's often the best person to ask about uh, things related to student life or um, even uh, student life just living in D.C. And <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, questions about fellowships and GW job opportunities are a little bit beyond my uh, pay grade, but I encourage you to look at um, this web page that's highlighted. Um, in terms of getting jobs at GW, you might talk also to Melissa uh, since she's a student working at the university. Um, and that's uh, all I have to say. Um, so we have, I think, plenty of time for questions, and uh, I encourage you to ask them. Just type your questions if you have any questions.
All right. Uh, all right. So I have uh, uh, two questions to start out with. Um, first, uh, how large is the incoming uh, cohort of students? It varies every year. Um, it, it varies usually between about 40 and 60. Classes are um, capped at 20 students, generally at the Elliott School. So <clears throat> um, I'm always focused on the 40 and 60 number because if we have a group of students that's closer to 40, that means that we have two sections of each of the um, core classes. Um, our student body, our incoming class last year was a little bit larger. Uh, it had about 55 students, so we made, a, we made three sections of all the cohorts. Um, and uh, just so you know, it's, we have the core faculty members um, teach all the core classes. So, and we, we tend to team teach them. So when we have two or three sections, uh, different professors take uh, different modules of the class. Um, and if you were <clears throat> interested in sitting in on the policy and practice class, um, that one is one of the core classes. It has three sections. So as I mentioned in my email, uh, it meets Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. Um, and um, the other question I uh, had was to speak a little bit more about the capstone process. Um, so this is something we've been doing uh, almost 20 years um, at the IDS program, uh, program and we've, um, we've kind of adapted, I think, to a very good process that is both student-driven um, but includes a lot of oversight and advising from faculty. So at the end of your first year, um, so our first year students are doing this right now, uh, you, will, you will establish groups with uh, your peers um, in your incoming class. And those, uh, those groups are generally, um, generally created around common thematic interests. Um, because you're, you're, you're thinking you want to do a project, let's say in public health, or you want to do a project <clears throat> that involves uh, agricultural development or governance or human rights or whatever. Um, and sometimes you have kind of a, a coming together of different interests. So, you know, often we'll have groups where there might be one person who is particularly focused on gender and development and a couple other people who are focused on public health and they decide they want to do something related to public health and gender. Um, over the summer, you, you work on establishing a prospectus for your group, um, a very brief outline of your capabilities and your interests. Uh, that you can then send out to potential clients. Uh, you also make a, potential, you know, a list of potential clients and you do some of your own research um, in the area to make sure that you're um, kind of current in all of the major debates about um, the issue that you're most interested in. And then in the fall, you, you essentially uh, pitch your idea to various groups. Um, and that involves a little bit of negotiation because really you want uh, something that's going to be particularly useful to, to the organization you're working for so that they're more invested in it. Um, and they often will cover um, expenses for travel. There's also a, a fund from the Elliott School that you can apply to for travel funds. Uh, and then over your spring break, you uh, do your research. And um, by the end of the school year, you're presenting 
your research and, and giving deliverables to your clients. Um, so, uh, question about advisors. Uh, let me just see if I can get, whoops, let me get the chat here so I can see everything. Um, <clears throat> How are students paired with advisors? <clears throat> and how often do students generally meet with their advisors? So <clears throat> what we do is we realize that a lot of students don't know exactly what they want to do when they enter the program. Um, there is a process in the first semester where you um, have to uh, put together a plan of study, which is at that point mostly theoretical. And often students are not completely decided on their field of specialization. Um, and uh, at that point, we, we essentially divide students up by their um, expertise um, with different advisors. <clears throat> it, um, as I said, it's, it, your interests may change. Um, so it may not be the, uh, the penultimate pairing initially, but, um, we try to we try to match interests as much as possible, and you're essentially you know the advisors are available to students all the time. Um, you absolutely have to meet with your advisor that first semester as you're putting together your um, plan of study, um, and um, you're you're we we encourage students to meet with any professors with whom you share specific interest and um, professors are always open uh, for meeting with students. So, <clears throat> I mean, my, my office hours are always quite busy. Um, so students, you know, I think feel very comfortable uh, approaching their advisors. Um, and we try to make sure to advise you essentially um, both on your classes, but while taking in consideration your career goals. Um, and then I should also mention you'll also have advisors uh, through the graduate student uh, graduate uh, student services, um, and they focus on specifically um, making sure that you you are fulfilling requirements. Um, but they also have a lot of resources to to help you along uh, in your career development and your job searches. So. Um, you, we kind of work very hand in hand that way. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's up to the student, but you have a lot of face time with advisors if you, if you wish to. Um, so uh, a question about how most IDS students spend their day with classes in the evening. So, um, I would say, uh, and, and the person was asking about, do, do most work full-time, part-time internships work on campus? Um, they, uh, it's, it's all of the above. <laughs> um, so we have some students that work on campus. Uh, you know, there's some uh, campus work that carries credit uh, as a benefit, which a lot of students will try to take advantage of. Um, we have a lot of students who will do internships. If you have, if you don't have much experience in international development, uh, we highly encourage you to um, take advantage of internships in DC and the graduate student services provides a lot of help with that. We try to help with that. Alumni send us notices and so on. Uh, I would say, you know, it varies by year, but you know, maybe, 25% are working full time. Um, they may come to the program already uh, working full time, uh, a lot of them in development, sometimes uh, in another field. One thing I will mention is I, I highly discourage you from um, studying full time and, um, and working full time. And, um, uh, an important point on that is that you will hear uh, if you receive a fellowship offer that you are obliged to 
uh, study full time. However, uh, if if you do receive that and you do work full time, I would encourage you to contact the admissions office and find out if there's some flexibility about that, um, because I think it's um, it's often waived uh, so that you can go to go uh, you can study part time and still receive your fellowship. Um, Okay. Uh, how could incoming students go about attaining assistantships related to their field of study? Um, <clears throat> well, there is, uh, I would encourage you if you're interested in employment opportunities on campus, again, to contact Melissa. Um, there, there, there is no formal um, assistantship uh, program related to the MA uh, programs at the Elliott School, but a lot of professors um, are working on externally funded uh, grants that may allow them to hire students. Um, and we have several research institutes uh, at the Elliott School that have um, these, these sort of research projects, uh, some of them which do offer assistantships. Um, uh, and we also have, um, there's some programs I know both at the Asian Studies Institute and the Europe, uh, Eurasian and Russian Studies uh, Institute that um, that offer graduate students an opportunity to um, uh, do some research assistance uh, ships with uh, professors. Um, I've benefited from that before. I've used um, research assistance from their programs. Um, you know, they're they're uh, they're just part time um, uh, work that's uh, kind of intended to get students an opportunity to be involved with. Professors' research, um, and so there there are opportunities like that, and you you essentially have to seek them out. And I do encourage you to look at um, Josh um, and Danielle have uh, provided some information about the. The career development and academic advising <clears throat> through the graduate student services. Uh, question about how important is regional focus in the program? Um, that is a, a very much a personal decision. I think that uh, I, I find that some students enter the program uh, very adamant about their regional focus, others not as much. Um, Generally, students will, even even those who are uh, who have a regional focus, um, might not take a lot of classes related to the region. Uh, for one, usually when somebody has a regional focus, uh, they already have um, a specific interest and in, um, a lot of uh, background in that region. Um, and two, you can focus on uh, thematic classes and doing your term papers and research projects focused on that specific region. Um, you know, I can kind of tell you from my own experience, I'm an anthropologist. When I got my PhD in anthropology, uh, the program I was in, my, my area of my regional uh, focus is in Central Asia and the former Soviet Union. There weren't really classes in anthropology about that region, um, but I would always be writing my research papers for any class I took on that region. Um, so a lot of students do that. Um, and there is certainly plenty of opportunity to take regional classes. As I mentioned, we have uh, uh, an Institute of Africa Studies, we have an Institute of Middle East Studies, we have an Institute of um, Europe, Russian, Eurasian studies, and we have an Institute of Asian studies. Uh, 
we don't have an Institute of Latin American Studies yet, but we do have um, a Latin American Studies program uh, that also provides classes on uh, Latin America. So there's there's plenty of um, there's plenty of opportunity to get regional expertise. And and one thing I wanted to note too um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, what what students do during the day. Um, some students will find, uh, you know, their first semester they might not want to jump into a uh, a job or internship. There's no better place to be um, for uh, events about international development than in Washington D.C. Um, there are constantly events. Uh, I I you know always bemoan that I'm unable to take advantage of the full. Uh, scope of events that um, are around the city at any given time, um, but sometimes students that first semester will just focus on that and really get um, a lot of uh, information that way. Um, <clears throat> so a uh, question about how common is it for students to conduct research for the capstone abroad? within the region of interest focus. Um, essentially, um, that is um, almost always the case. Um, now, it's not obligatory to do your um, capstone, uh, to do capstone field work abroad, uh, but in my experience, almost always students have um, the only exception is this year when their travel was canceled. Um, but um, traditionally, students uh, have gone abroad, and as I mentioned, there's a um, there's a fund at the Elliott School that helps finance travel for Capstone. And often in our program, um, if you if you establish uh, a project that is particularly um, of use to your client, your client will cover those expenses. But usually it is applied research for a client in the field, um, and you know it usually means that it aligns with your interests, uh, whether it's thematic or regional, um, because you have established that relationship uh, with the client. And uh, how long do you Students typically spend abroad conducting this research. It's usually uh, two weeks. Um, you have your spring break, and usually students will go uh, either the week before spring break and spring break, or spring break and the week after, uh, and make sure to um, let their professors know uh, beforehand that they will be missing one, one week on either side of spring break. And um, another point is I really encourage students to do summer internships before um, or in between their first and second year. The Elliott School has funds um, to help students do internships abroad, and we found that students will work uh, in development organizations in the field abroad uh, during that summer, and that is a critical addition to your CV and to your experience. And basically, um, you know, we, we have a very specific focus on, on field work because we know that in international development, that's a very important part of uh, getting employment. Uh, are you aware of any cases where a student has studied abroad on a fellowship such as a born or Fulbright during the semester and use that time uh, use that time for capstone research? Uh, that becomes very difficult because the capstone is actually a group project. Um, we have had students do um, a born fellowship um, and they've had to actually extend their IDS program uh, to facilitate that, and they've done the, uh, they've come back and joined the next cohort after doing their year uh, in the field with a fellowship. Um, and 
Yeah, and, and, you know, if you have more questions about that, I, I would be, you know, specific questions, I'd be glad to do that. Um, and please refer to that email I sent. If you have any follow-up, we're very, we'll be very happy to try to help you. Uh, it's been a pleasure meeting you all virtually, and um, I hope I get to meet a lot of you in person this fall.